Hi folks, this is the deep learning section of the Big Data Application Analytics course, E534. And now we're going to do uh, one of the industrial applications, then we recommend our engines. An area where there's been a significant change in technology. Uh, the original uh, lectures for this course on recommender engines didn't mention deep learning once, uh, whereas uh, these lectures only effectively mention deep learning because it is now becoming a preeminent way and is used by the largest problem, la the, the applications with the largest problem size. So let's get going. Recommender engines. Okay, let's see what there is as usual. It's largely hidden. We will start with Google News, which is, I'm not quite certain where to put it. It's a pretty, I find it a pretty useful resource. And then this is certainly a recommender engine in that it is choosing, or <coughs> relatively automatically actually, is recommending news items for me to read. And um, the problem of dividing documents, which are for Google News or articles on the web, <coughs> mainly information sites and dividing them into topics, which Google News has lots of topics, is a well-studied problem where classically the latent Dirichlet allocation method LDA is the best known approach. You take the documents, divide them into words, count the words in each document, use them to match documents, automatically form topics because of the similarity of word occurrence, and then you assign the documents to topics. Um, you could do deep learning, and I don't actually know what Google does. Um, and I could identify latent variables using uh, autoencoders or something. But as I said, like in most cases, where something very important, it's often a secret. There is a paper which uh, does discuss using a multilayer perceptron, a type of, uh, which we know is a type of deep learning for news prediction and uh, matching it to articles already read by a user. That's a classic recommender engine approach. Do you have something characterizing a user, which is what they've done, or maybe that you can either do item or content, so what they've done, what they've looked at, or what properties they have, whether old or young, or, or male or female, or what have you. Uh, that is then used to do uh, the classification. But the, we do, that's just an example of where I recommend, uh, and this is an example that where recommender engines are possible, but it's up to you to decide what the right approach is. All right, so let's go to YouTube. And at least there are now some papers on YouTube. Um, there is a paper in, there's a, standard conference in the field called Rexis in 2016. This is a Google team wrote an article on deep neural networks for YouTube. So that just shows you when all this started. Uh, there is an MIT undergraduate who in this towards data science, a well-known website, just actually effectively reviewed this paper. Um, there is another such thing uh, later, another such site as well. Um, with a slightly different title, with a similar, similar, it's a similar um, setup of a, of a review of the paper. It's also worth noticing that when Netflix um, advertises for people, it says that they have a problem similar to Google. So we know that Netflix uses recommender engines, which we would know already from what Netflix is. Um, now YouTube. Technology is actually built by Google Brain. Google Brain is a part of Google focusing on AI. And they actually, they probably do some research because they publish papers. But they also do things of value to the company, including providing technology to YouTube. And um, they have two papers at the very latest Rexis, which effectively describe aspects of what YouTube does now. I don't actually think they mention the word YouTube in the papers, but they define it in an abstract fashion. Although Co uh, Covington here points out 
YouTube has undergone a fundamental paradigm shift towards using deep learning as a general purpose solution for nearly all learning problems. Google Brain, which uh, was their software, actually not the team, was open source as TensorFlow, and then it uh, says why TensorFlow is wonderful. But it's important to realize that this, this, these two lines here, they tell you what I've been saying for this course. Deep learning has taken over almost everything. And so we have to bear that in mind as we move, as we just decide what to do and how to do it. All right, so here is a little picture of um, the YouTube approach which has two deep learnings, deep learning network number one and deep learning network number two. And they have this two-phase approach, actually both of them use the information about the user and the overall context, what other people are doing and what the world is like. Then in the first um, phase, they take all the world's videos, essentially, millions, maybe billions of videos. I don't have any, there's certainly a lot of videos these days. And then they form a candidate set, which are hundreds in size. Too many, but but uh, down in a, by a big factor. And here, the main uh, problem is to avoid recommending anything that's not useful. Um, you don't want to recommend a bad video because there, if there are millions or tens of millions of videos, there are millions to tens of millions of bad videos. When we get to the hundreds, it's more important to get the right answer. So that's uh, um, this uh, this ranking pro uh, method here is optimized to get the best answer. This one is optimized to avoid recommending something the user won't like. Because if you start recommending videos the user doesn't like, you will not find YouTube doing well. Whereas recently, it's actually probably the best performing part of Google. I don't know whether it's good or bad. Is it better to be good at search, advertising, or videos? Both of them are rather um, depressing non-fundamental issues. So here we are. Um, so this actually defines more precisely the roles of these networks. Um, then we have here, the um, this one here optimizes for precision, which is the ratio of the number of good um, positives over the number of good plus bad. So it doesn't care about the number of positives, it just, because there's so many videos, it depends on this ratio. It wants to reduce the number of red things, so that this precision is as big as possible. And now we come to the case where we only have a few hundred or hundreds of, of, of videos. Now we want to have a very high recall, which is the ratio of um, good over possibly good. So we really get as many of the good ones as possible. As we don't have very many videos, we're not so worried about the false positives. So that's just uh, pointing out that uh, different searches with different, in different uh, circumstances can have different uh, trade-offs. All right, so here we have this uh, first uh, neural network, neural network number one. And basically, we're trying to um, uh, de define a set of classes by uh, an unsupervised algorithm, and those class and find the probabilities that the that the videos belong to classes. And uh, here we have uh, we feed in things that represent the user, what they've watched, what they've searched, and things they've uh, characterizing the user. And then we learn from that about these videos. Then when we learn from that, we use a nearest neighbor search to find the ones that are near the current user. 
And you can do this uh, classification problem. We're trying to classify videos. Um, then we can <coughs> then there are various um, depths of network. We're starting off with 256 um, um, I, I, um, variables specifying a user, and then we can either go um, by what we can do various um, sizes for the hidden networks 5256 itself, 512, 1024, 248. And those we just. So you have choices about how much you, um, information you, you train on. And here we have um, what the user watches, what the user searches and watches. Also, some not only the user actions, but also the sort of specification of the user, like their age. And then we see that with all features, we get an average position of around 13%. And we just looked at the watches as about half of that. So the more complex networks are uh, dominating. I should say that these networks are uh, feed in both the video information and the user information together. That's a so-called two-tire approach, which is um, used in these sophisticated systems, not in the elementary systems. Um, so here we have uh, um, the, the final network, which is the second one, which has got to give a one that will really find the best uh, things for the user. And um, we have here again, we're feeding in various informations and look, normalizing it. And um, again, we have the video and the user. And then we produce a list of uh, things for the user to look at. Here are these performances with different numbers of um, internal layers showing that the um, the per user loss is the fraction of bad bad um, videos, and uh, it's actually pretty high, 35 percent. It's not a huge effect here. 42 uh, percent uh, where you don't do anything, and 35 percent if you work hard. So I guess that's important, but it's not a huge effect. All right, so that's a survey. Uh, very it has to be an overview because we don't actually have much detail on the, except these very general principles, which are so daunting given the size of the problem they're solving. It's pretty difficult to check them. Um, here we have some remarks on what Spotify, another user recommender engine does. It um, <coughs> uses classic collaborative filtering, which um, compares the individual characteristics. It looks at the text in each song to see, to analyze that, to be able to do a good match to the user's preferences. It also looks at the audio structure. Um, and then we have a one slide on each of these methods. Uh, collaborative filtering is effectively, this is the basic method used for recommender engines. So, if you find a person which likes some um, set of tracks, and there's a uh, another person here who actually likes uh, three tracks in common with this first this person on the left, then it's probable the person on the right likes P, and the person on the left likes T. So you use the experiences of related users to extend the scope for the user. That under, underlies what's actually been done in those deep learning networks used by YouTube, um, but it's more usually implemented by a much more classic method like nearest neighbor methods. And the older videos for this class go through it in great detail. I don't set it for this class because I think it's out of date. Um, here we have how they do natural language processing. And Spotify just looks all over the web for material, text material on on music and songs and artists. 
and they look at which um, adjectives and language are used to describe them, and which artists and songs are discussed along with each text. Then it looks at the top terms that are associated with a particular song or artist, and um, then they give a score, which is uh, the description, which effectively tells you how important that concept is for the song or artist. And then you can use that again with rather well, classic information retrieval technology, TFI. TFIDF is a classic way of judging the, um, in a normalized fashion, the importance of the occurrence of a particular term. Um, this, but why we have Dancing Queen, that's just because of the particular uh, band we were looking at. This is quite old. Um, to look at the audio, it actually does the audio with a convolutional neural net, and you get out of the, you classify the audio, and you run the audio through the neural net and classify it um, in things like tempo, loudness, etc. And then it, um, you get these um, C and M produced uh, classification of each audio segment, and you use that to match audio signals. Then you have three different methods, and we have one. We know that one of the curses and blessings of having multiple ways of looking at something, you can get a better answer by, by combining them. But also, you forget, you don't really know why the recommendation was made, because it's actually combined all sorts of different recommendations. And the final decisions are weighted average of many different um, inputs. Um, here is a, a, um, how to use variation autoencoders. And this was an article about using autoencoders to make uh, classical recommender nature and uh, recommender systems obsolete and how to implement them. And then there is a measure, then it looks at different methods and produces an accuracy. And it, it does. Um, the accuracy, where the larger the the accuracy, the better, and the personalization tells you how different the recommendations are for each people. So if you perso is one, this is this last uh, row, that means uh, people tend to get different recommendations. If it's small like here, they all get the same recommendation. Um, then you look at these different methods, which will define in the next slides, you can see there are huge variations in performance. Some are very much better at personalization than others. And the most important one, the actual performance, is really different between the variation autoencoders and some of these other methods. Big factors. So here we have the um, content based filtering that uses the nature of what you're trying to recommend to uh, do the recommendation. Because you don't know a lot about the data in movie lens, this is not very effective. The so-called memory-based method is the Kate nearest neighbor algorithm described in detail in the previous lectures. Non-negative matrix factorization is another classic method. Um, we have a neural version of that, which doesn't seem to work very well. Then we have various um, deep learning methods, restricted Boltzmann, decollaborative, autoencoder. Autoencoders are the more, most natural ones to use because they automatically learn efficient representations because they're doing dimension reduction. And then we have hybrid, which average memory based, the classical method, and autoencoder. And then there's a second article which describes several other uh, GAN and autoencoder approaches.